Hello, Divanauts, and welcome to Latin American Divas, the current season of Cronista de Indias, the YouTube channel entirely dedicated to Latin American studies by yours truly, Professor Andrea Lorena Fernandez. In the last episode, episode 10 of the season, we introduced the second unit of the course, Latin American Divas, which is dedicated to the 19th century. We call this unit Soberanas Repúblicas, or Sovereign Republics. The unit consists of roughly two uh, historical periods from 1800 to 1830 when we address the thick of the revolutionary wars uh, and um, a, as a brief period of relaxation in gender norms and the second period is 1830 to 1900 the age of caudillos where there is a backlash against gender um, ambiguity after the revolution with nation building and industrialization this current episode, episode one, uh, episode 11 of season one of Latin American Divas is titled Policarpa Salabarrieta La Pola, Colombia's Independent Seamstress Spy. And all my Colombian friends are like, yay, yay, sparkle, sparkle. Uh, this is for you guys, love you. Uh, the episode is divided into two sections. The first one, we go over La Pola's uh, biography. And the second one is, uh, we review the 2010 telenovela by RCN Colombia, titled La Pola, Amar la Iso Libre. Divas of Latin American revolutions may be called Juanas or Rabonas for short. Rabonas or Juanas were characterized by contraband, uh, getting involved in the patriot uh, cause because of family or male relatives who were already in the cause. They capitalized on social invisibility to gather intelligence. Uh, when they achieved desertion in royalist forces by using their charisma, this, this, their charisma, this was called seduction. And they also served as support to the troops and sometimes even in combat. So La Pola was not ex non, uh, not an exception. Some of her characteristics, we're going to have three groups here. We're going to have one, secret identities. Two, we're going to talk about her as a criolla or mestiza seamstress. And three, special abilities. So she already sounds like a Dungeons and Dragons character, but we're going to have, we're, we're teaching this way. There it is. Um, in her secret identities, we actually have several names for Pola. We have La Pola, Policarpa, Apolonia, Sarabarrieta, and those are interchangeable in documents, usually because a spy needs to remain incognito to get away with being a spy. So it makes sense that she would have several names in use. Uh, as a criolla and mestiza seamstress, we actually don't know whether she was a mestiza or not. In the official currency of Colombia from the 1980s and 90s, she is visibly whitewashed, so she looks more like a criolla. But in the telenovela, they emphasize the fact that she's a mestiza and the actress is a mestiza herself. So there is this tug of war between what race La Pola actually was. Uh, but what is really uh, that what we really need to address here is that she was racially ambiguous enough as a colonial subject to afford herself social mobility and invisibility when needed. So the fact that she was a working class woman, middle lower middle class um, seamstress, meant that she could go outside on chaperone and that afforded her uh, agency in public. The as I said. Uh, the working class status meant that she could go outside the home and usually she served wealthier clients connected to New Granada's or Bogota's vice regal court. So she was rubbing elbows with important people while rem remaining invisible. She listens to conversations in royalist homes and collects that contraband intelligence and passes it to a ring that extended from Santa Fe de Bogota to Popayán, Medellín, Cali, Cartagena, Caracas, Medina, and Quito. With her allies, La Pola filters information from Bogota to the Patriot Cross, uh, the Patriot Cross, the length of the Magdalena River. So her spy ring or the people that she was connected to go up, up and down the whole entire length of Colombia. Which, if you take a look at Colombia in a map, it's huge. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. Our girl had reach. Among her special abilities, which made her ideal for the Patriot cause, were literacy. She, w she needed to pass information, and actually it was rare for working class women to be literate. Uh, also, rumors of liquor distillation, which is used for healing and for putting up your spirits if you're in battle. Logistics, provisioning, ammunition production, frontline combat, cryptography, 
uh, recruitment and seduction and family affairs. Her brother was also involved in the clandestine activities. In terms of her biography, she was born in Guaduas, a town in the backwater of uh, Colombia, a popular rest stop for travelers between the Caribbean and Bogota. So newspapers and information always pass through Guaduas first. It is the epicenter of the Comunero revolt led by Jose Antonio Galan in 1780. So there was a popular revolt that preceded independence and La Pola is the next generation after Ant Jose Antonio Galan. It is one of the first towns to illegally circulate Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man from 1791, translated by Antonio Nariño. In 1802, smallpox pandemic killed uh, both parents and three of her siblings, and she had to move to Bogota and eventually return to Guaduas. She seems to have been back and forth between the, uh, the capital and her, her town. Uh, in the city, she learns how to read and write, probably from women that she was uh, sewing for. And La Pola and Viviano lived in relative sta uh, stables lifelong, um, and had lifelong relationships with people across the country. So that traveling back and forth sets them up to uh, have a spy ring. So from 1816 to 1817, La Pola is to be found in Bogota, where she's an active seamstress and spy. She has an illegal aguardiente distillery, uh, recruits from taverns, garrisons, and wealthy homes for the Patriot uh, forces. She provides weapon supplies, infiltration, and might have at least helped in active combat as support troops, maybe as healers, uh, negotiator intelligence. We, we don't know exactly what. Um, capture, trial, and execution is, happens alongside her brother in October 1817. La Pola, along with eight of her collaborators, are executed on November, November 14, 1817. And she goes last, uh, never cease to scream, citing the rights of men uh, throughout the whole entire ordeal, kicking and biting, and she refused to kneel. Uh, it's kind of a legendary way to go. In the following months after her execution, other women and men in her spy ring were executed as well. While fear prevented uprisings immediately after her death, she captured popular imagination. She never became a martyr, um, a symbol of the revolution for the Republic of New Granada, but her active contributions went unstressed in official commemorations until the 1970s and 80s, so she doesn't get public recognition until later. She's been largely forgotten outside of Colombia, where Simón Bolívar reigns supreme as the liberator. And it is quite unfair because La Pola could be in many ways seen as La Gran Colombia's founding mother. And reinstating her into that role would uh, provide a lot of movement and uproar for social advancement the world over. Um, let's go to the second section of the episode. At RCN Colombia aired a telenovela in 2010, also titled La Pola, Amar la Iso Libre. And uh, we have it right here, we have the opening. So I'm gonna play it and hopefully like, my window doesn't ruin it for you. But you, you'll get the hang of it. Okay. Fire. Looking at the camera. No, wait, bathing. Hands, oh. Some lady running away from horse. Fight, fight, fight that asshole. Okay. Okay, well, if you haven't noticed the conspicuous presence of the love relationship between La Pola and Alejo Sabrain, her fellow collaborator, who we don't know even if he was her lover, uh, well, you, we need to go ahead and watch it again, because even in the trailer, it's rather obvious that uh, the focus of the TV show is La Pola as an uh, uh, object of love. 
Uh, so gendering the warrior woman in the 20th century is another of the topics that we want to address with this opening. Soldaderas of the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920 provide the best example. They suffered the same fate as La Pola uh, in films and telenovelas. The only difference being that La Pola airs in 2010. In fact, depictions of warrior woman archetype uh, come with all kinds of strings attached in Latin American culture. Uh, and it's included by not limited to the virginal or whore archetype, the femme fatale, the Marianista mor moralism. She usually dies at the end of the telenovela or is punished in some horrible way from deviating from society's gender expectations, mainly wearing pants and fighting in a war and uh, being an agent in, agent in public society. So uh, here's a sneak peek to the third unit of Latin American divas, Chicas Modernas. The Mexican Revolution spans the whole 20th century in three distinct periods. There's the military period, 1910 to 20, the organizational progressive period from 1920 to 40, and the conservative period from 1940 to about 2000. Some even argue that the present, in, into the present. It is in this last conservative period that Mexican silver screen films revamp the multi-ethnic soldadera into Maria Felix in films like La Cucaracha. This masculine warrior woman gets put back into her place socially, uh, into her socially assigned place when she becomes pregnant with uh, the colonel's child at a wedlock. But not before he scorns her for a pious widow, Isabel, and dies in combat. So La Cucaracha, in this 1959 film, is punished with single motherhood in warfare for being a woman at war, being a masculine woman. Watch the film, the music is excellent. The same thing happens to La Pola in Amar la Iso Libre. The episode one opens up with La Pola on the eve of her execution by royalists in 1817. Citing artificial Marianista modesty, she asks her jailers to turn away while she bathes and then momentarily escapes to meet her lover, Alejo Sabarain, in a neighboring cell. So this sets up the telenovela as primarily about these two people and not necessarily so much about the independence of Colombia. As seen in the trailer, the focus is on Pola's childhood star-crossed love with Alejo. She's a poor mestiza, he's a landed criollo, so there's a class difference. His father is the main villain, quite a bigot, and there's emphasis on her role as a seamstress and seductress of royalists. But this is not Mexico in 1959. This is Colombia in 2010. There are some updates to social views. So, one, La Pola's penchant for reading Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz have a Beauty and the Beast Hermione Granger effect on young girls. Like, I died. My inner six-year-old died when she saw that. Uh, you sit there with abuela. Uh, let's, let's remember that traditionally, Telenovelas are multi-generational women's rituals. You sit there with abuela, mama, mija, and the cat in the evening to bond over this story. Uh, if you don't believe me, the entire premise of Jane Xiomara Alba in the CW's Jane the Virgin is about presenting these three women as telenovela watchers. That is how they get over their troubles. Presenting female protagonists as readers like Jane, Pola, and Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, as well as warriors, is a priority in social advancement, so we give the telenovela props for that. Pola's closest allies, like his, the, her, her historical counterpart, are three men that she has known since childhood, like many other revolucionarias. They are Viviano, her brother, Alejo, the lover or collaborator, we're not sure, and Juliano, her friend. Juliano's role as a self-liberated slave under the Patriot cause, feeds into the mythology of La Gran Colombia's altruistic, egalitarian, utopian birth story, which may not necessarily be true in reality. His experience is filtered through the eyes of La Pola, who is, one, forced to live in a slave's barracks uh, owned by her brother-in-law, so she has to fraternize with the slaves and therefore develops close relationships and friendships with them. She teaches them how to read and write, and introduces them to the rights of men, translated by Antonio Nariño. La Pola's Europhile sister is actually in love with Julian, so there's a whole like love triangle between her, the husband, and Juliano. Uh, she La Pola inducts slaves into slaves into fighting for the patriots in exchange for emancipation. And the whole Pola and Alejo 
But while Paula and Alejo are killed at the end of the telenovela, Juliano and Catalina get a happily ever after, and they're an interracial couple. So uh, while the telenovela employs Marianismo and Bravado to construct Paula's character, the focus of the relationship is on her relationship is detrimental, but typical of the genre. You really can't ask much of a telenovela. You just gotta enjoy it as is, sitting there with abuela. That's what you gotta do. Like women warrior, warriors the world over, mainstream discomfort with women's public agency prompts an sanitation of history into pop culture. La Pola, however, is redeemed by endorsing women's literacy and Afro-Colombian visibility in telenovelas. However, Colombia, you gotta work on the tokenism, though, Colombia. We gotta work on that. The tokenism is pretty bad. We gotta mm -mm, upgrade that. Um, in episode 11 of Latin American Divas, we have gone over two aspects of La Pola. One, her biography. Two, uh, her manifestations in pop culture in the 20th century and how she's recorded by the public. In... The next episode, season one, episode 12 of Latin American Divas, we're going to take a look at a court case for Doña Carmen Camacho, a seducer of royalist troops in Mexico in 1811. She didn't actually seduce the garrison, she convinced people to switch sides, but that was, of course, a sexualized crime and it was tried as treason. Thank you for taking the time to learn about Latin American Divas right here with Cronista de Indias, where new episodes drop every Friday. Please hit the subscribe button. I think it's in this corner right over here. Check it out. Uh, so you never miss an episode of Latin American Divas. As always, a million thanks for viewing, liking, and sharing the episodes. And do as the poster says. You gotta do epic shit. Have a wonderful afternoon. Oh, it's Brooklyn. The sirens are the police. La policia.